In this Wrestle Talk News, shocking WWE Hall of Fame plans, an update on the Elite's AEW future, and Tempest review of SmackDown. Subscribe and enable notification to always on for daily wrestling news videos. Support Wrestle Talk! It's Sat E Day and it's Sat E Time, so let's. Go! Last night on SmackDown, we saw WWE finally announce the first inductee for the 2023 Hall of Fame ceremony. And you know what? It was pretty unexpected with the very much currently active Rey Mysterio getting the nod to uh, likely be this year's headliner. So the question now is, of course, who? 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 Who else is getting in there, Tempest? Who else? Who? According to Fightful and also reported by PW Insider, Japanese icon, the great Muta is set for an induction into this year's WWE class of 2023, despite never appearing for the company. PW Insider, however, could not confirm whether Muta would be making any appearance on WWE TV prior to his induction being made official. Muta may have never appeared for WWE, however, he has had a recent association with the company, namely his recent match of current WWE star Shinsuke Nakamura in Pro Wrestling Noah as part of Muta's retirement tour. Pro Wrestling Love. Mwah. A match that was reported to be a trade off in a working relationship between the two companies. So, maybe this is part of that. Just wish there was more time for a Muta match at Mania. Oh well. Sticking with WrestleMania, and unfortunately, it looks like two SmackDown stars may be set to miss the Hollywood festivities. Most notably of these is Rowdy Ronda Rousey, who according to Wrestling Observer Newsletter is dealing with a hairline fracture of her arm, which is reportedly why she hasn't been getting too physical since making her return on February 10th. Despite this, WWE are hopeful of Rousey still appearing at Mania, with plans originally pointing towards a women's tag title match for herself and Shayna Baszler. However, with current champs Becky Lynch and Lita set to compete in a six women tag at Mania, these plans are still up in the air. Less promising, however, is the status of Kofi Kingston, who was unfortunately pulled from last night's IC title five-way number one contendership match due to sustaining an ankle injury on last week's show. An injury that looks set to keep Kingston out of action for five weeks, according to the Wrestling Observer Newsletter, which of course would see him miss the deadline to compete at WrestleMania. We at WrestleTalk would like to wish Kofi and Rousey all the best in their respective recoveries. And lastly, we finish up with three soon to be out of contract AEW stars that have been strongly linked with a move to WWE recently. That being Kenny Omega, Matt and Nick Jackson, or, as we know them, the elite, the, the elite, the elite, the, the elite. Bum, 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 bum. Super kick party! Yeah. What's well, unsurprising that WWE would be interested in snatching up the elite to complete their AEW EVP full set like toy collectibles. The onus naturally falls on AEW president Tony Khan to secure the former trio's champs to long-term deals. All of that took a lot out of me. One super kick. Leave me alone, Tempest, I'm unhealthy. And according to Dave Meltzer's Wrestling Observer newsletter, that's exactly what TK is planning to do. What is currently unclear to us, at least when exactly the deal... <laughs> well, it is currently unclear to us at least when exactly the Elite's AEW deals run out due to potential injury time possibly being added and such, it is expected to be at some point this year. We did it. Yes! That's not a hot tag, I, I'm just, I'm, I'm walking off. And as for whatever the Bucks and Kenny will sign the deals or instead move across to the WWE, Meltzer weighed in saying, with the Bucks, while they may do well in WWE, it's not guaranteed and they will have a better schedule in AEW, meaning more time with the family and also less matches and can do their style. With Omega, he doesn't have kids and he would likely get a major push and would have no end to having fresh opponents. It would also close the door to Japan that he's waited years to reopen. Where do you want to see the Elite land next? Let us know in the comments below. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I introduce to you the man that helped me finish the script, finish reading the news to you. He's the man, the one and the only, he is Tempest, woo! You and me, we're the Elite. We are the Elite. House of the Black Mask. Let's go out, it's dark and I run away. See you later.
A big shout out to our Patreons, the Roller Costa, Robert Acosta, and Chris, the Cypriot Sensation Petru. Thank you, Sat. Everyone should get themselves a guy like Sat. Everyone should get themselves a Moss guy like Tempest. He's the best. Look at him, sexy ass. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Show me! I'm Tempest, and this is my review of SmackDown in about five minutes. We open with the arrival of the Usos with Jay telling Paul Heyman to let Roman know that he's here and telling Kayla Braxton that everything he has to say, he'll say in the ring. We then got our opening match, that being the fatal five-way number one contenders match between Sheamus, Karrion Cross, LA Knight, Drew McIntyre, and Xavier Woods who replaced Kofi Kingston after Kofi got hurt in the brawl last week. Could you? You already know that because of that guy reading you the news. Yes! This was a really fun match given plenty of time. SmackDown has done these kind of matches a lot since Triple H took over, and while it does feel a little bit repetitive, they are also pretty much always good. This match felt a bit chaotic and messy at times with just a lot happening at once, but in a match of this style, that's not necessarily a bad thing. There were loads and loads of Sheamus versus Drew McIntyre teases throughout this match, but none more overt than the finish with both men squaring off and Sheamus catching Woods with a brogue kick off the ropes and McIntyre hitting a Claymore on Knight and both men getting the pin at the same time. I called this finish on last week's podcast, so yippee for me, even if I think this one was a bit of a layup, they did execute the finish flawlessly, which is impressive given how tricky it can be to force a draw in WWE sometimes. Triple threat incoming, and it just might steal the show come WrestleMania. Four out of five. Paul Heyman cuts a fantastic backstage promo talking to Kayla about how Roman Reigns in his infinite wisdom strategized that the bloodline should attack Cody Rhodes with the truth, because with Cody dealing with the baggage of his inescapable past, when he gets in the ring at WrestleMania, he will have already lost and he will be forced to acknowledge his tribal chief. God, he's good at this. Sheamus and Drew are yelling at each other backstage, and then WWE announced the first inductee into the 2023 Hall of Fame would be Rey Mysterio. I believe this is the first case of an active member of the roster being inducted into the Hall of Fame since Ric Flair in 2008. If I'm wrong, let me know in the comments. They played an awesome video package of everyone talking about how awesome Rey Mysterio is, and then Rey came out to be immediately interrupted by Dominic. Dominic asked how many birthdays, Christmases, Thanksgivings, and soccer games Rey had to miss to build that Hall of fame career and he said he's ashamed to be his son. Legato del Fantasma came out and challenged Judgment Day to a match right now. They show the progressive match flow of the week and then came back to the match already in progress. Bad pacing, sorted it out. The match though was again very fun. I love getting to see guys like Finn Balor and Damian Priest wrestle on SmackDown because that doesn't happen very often and then I start thinking about a singles match between Balor and Santos Escobar and you tell me that wouldn't be great. Rhea Ripley got involved on the outside and Dominic hit Ray with a baseball slide prompting Ray to try and get in the ring which distracted the referee long enough for Priest to hit a kick and allow Dominic to get the pin. After the match, Dominic said he wanted the ring to have a man-to-man with his dad and told Ray that the only Hall of Fame that he should be in is the Deadbeat Dad Hall of Fame and said he should have been Eddie's son instead. I mean, that's your fault, Dom. You got in the ring and shook the ladder at SummerSlam. Eddie could have won that match. Ray still wouldn't fight his son, but he did toss him to the outside. A bit of progression, it seems, but otherwise an effective three-part segment and an awesome video package. Four out of five. Charlotte Flair tells Adam Pearce that she wants a match tonight, and then we got the Viking Raiders versus Braun Strowman and Ricochet. This was a pretty straightforward match for the most part. The Vikings took out Braun, they got the heat on Ricochet, and then Braun finally got the hot tag and charged over the announce desk again, which he does a lot lately, it seems. But when Ricochet took out Eric with a dive to the outside, things got stupid. Valhalla raised her hand, and Ricochet was terrified, scampering back in the ring with Michael Cole saying that she'd put a spell over him or something. Must we devolve back into women? Wimpy baby faces and spooky bullshit. WWE. Ivar then hit a big splash off the top rope for the win, so at the very least, the Viking Raiders have gotten a much needed win. Three out of five. Adam Pierce is backstage with Imperium, and Walter tears him apart for not finding a singular challenger for him and his title, and then Pierce says he has a solution. Next week, Sheamus and Drew will go one on one, and the winner will face Walter at WrestleMania. Schmaz finish incoming. We then got Charlotte Flair versus Shotzi. This was easily the weakest thing on the show, unfortunately, as the crowd had zero heat for this match. It was a double baby face match. Shotzi has not been protected at all. The action wasn't very good with Shotzi missing a kick on the outside. It just wasn't their night. Rhea Ripley came out halfway through the match to watch from ringside, and she witnessed Charlotte beat Shotzi with the figure eight. After the match, they both got on the mic and said they have both improved since WrestleMania 36. I thought this could have really been the time for Rhea to lean into how much that first loss to Charlotte really affected her and how this match is finally her redemption. But instead, it was just more of the same. 
They were getting the what chance from the crowd the whole time as well. Just nothing to this one, two out of five. The Usos then came out for the main event segment and Jay gets on the mic to say that everyone has been asking why he did it. And it is because this is his family and Sami Zayn isn't. He said he didn't want to do it, but he had to do it and asked the crowd to put themselves in his shoes and ask themselves what they would have done. He says there's only one person that he blames and that is Sami Zayn. Jay Uso is such a wonderfully tragic character on WWE's TV right now, everything that he's done has played into the fact that he is being abused by his family, but he still has to back his family for the sake of the family. He brought up his kids and going to the grocery store and not being able to do all of those things if the family is unhappy. And so thus to keep that from being the case, he has to back Roman. He has to back Jimmy because that's his twin and it makes for such great storytelling and such a great character. Jimmy says now that they have dealt with the Sami Zayn problem, they can focus on Cody Rhodes. Cody then comes out and says he keeps hearing his name, and if they're gonna talk about him, then maybe they can talk to him, but maybe, just maybe instead, they should just fight. Jimmy says if Cody gets in the ring, he won't make it to WrestleMania, but then hooded Sami Zayn rushes through the crowd to attack Jey Uso while Cody brawls with Jimmy into the crowd. Cody and Sami eventually stand tall as the show ends with nary a Roman Reigns in sight. Considering Roman was pretty solidly promoted for this show and this segment, I can't help but feel like this was some false advertisement, and this segment really could have used a Roman Reigns touch. Jay's promo was certainly good and definitely carried the segment. I mean, it was basically the whole segment, but I still think that the whole thing could have used the subtle storyline touches that Roman Reigns' performances always bring to the table. As it stands, this main event segment gets a four out of five. Overall, SmackDown had some very fun matches to build up WrestleMania, but to me, the best action was definitely in the first half of the show. This SmackDown is gonna get a four out of five. And that just about wraps things up for me, but before I go, make sure to check out the latest edition of Three Count right here on the Russell Talk YouTube channel with Ollie and Luke breaking down on every WrestleMania in three words or less. Until next time, I've been Tempest, and that was wrestling. Welcome to the one, two, three! Count. Count. You see, look, we listened to you, audience. You said you wanted us to scissor in the last episode at the...